When I was 12 years old, I thought I had a communication disorder. I still remember coming back from the U.S. the first day of my sixth grade social studies class. Mr. Mochizuki, my teacher, said a word that I didn't understand. So I raised my hand, interrupted him, and asked what that word meant. I wish I could tell you what I asked, but I can't, because I didn't get an answer. Instead, the class exploded into laughter, and I heard one of my classmates say, wow, this guy doesn't know that. Is he really Japanese? Even Mr. Mochizuki said, look that up by yourself, leaving me with only the shame of asking. After the first month back in Japan, I learned three important rules in Japanese communication. Rule number one, never interrupt someone when they're talking, even if you're confused. That's considered rude. Rule number two, never clarify and ask questions if you can look that up later by yourself. You're cutting corners. Rule number three, never think out loud. If you're going to open your mouth, you better think deeply of what you're going to say. A samurai cannot take back his sword. These rules quickly became my norm, because whenever I broke one of them, teachers got angry and classmates laughed at me. Sixteen years later, I was sitting in a marketing class in Charlottesville, Virginia, getting my MBA degree. This time, I had a hard time speaking up. Looking back now, I know exactly why. Though I was speaking English, I was following the three Japanese communication rules. Never interrupt, never clarify, never speak up until you're absolutely comfortable explaining your idea. Again, I felt I had a communication disorder, this time for the opposite reason feeling afraid to say something stupid when I spoke up. So you may be wondering why someone with a communication disorder standing here telling you how to become a better global communicator. Well, something interesting happened to me six years ago, which transformed me from an alien with a communication disorder to someone who now teaches global communication and collaboration to both native and non-native English speakers. And I know a lot of you now are collaborating with your global colleagues or customers through phone and video conferences, and those who aren't will soon be. So I hope my talk, my story, will give you the tools you can use to help you improve your global communication skills. Okay, so what happened to me back in 2010? I started to use this website called Odesk. Has any one of you have heard of this site? How about one of these sites? Okay, what these sites are, are global outsourcing portals where you can access to over 9 million freelancers from all over the world and hire them at a fraction of the price you're paying now if you live in a developed world. I heard about this website from a friend of mine who outsourced his corporate logo to a Ukrainian designer for just $30. That's about 3,000 yen. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? And since I was running an innovative English conversation school, I thought of taking advantage of this site for my business. Since then, I've been hooked on global outsourcing. And over the past six years, I've hired over 150 freelancers from over 20 different countries, from Armenia to Uganda. By the way, these are the freelancers, some of the freelancers that I currently work with, like Katrina, who I hired through Odesk, 
Uh, she lives in the Philippines and has been my personal assistant for the past five years. She manages my emails. She helps me find data or information when I'm writing a new blog post. She helps me format my PowerPoint slides so I can fully concentrate on the most important tasks that need my full attention. And you might be thinking that, oh, I would like to have a personal assistant too to do some of my routine tasks for just $2, from, from $2 to $5 per hour, which is about 200 to 500 yen per hour. But when I started using this website, it was a nightmare. For example, when hiring an artist, though their portfolio might look great, very few actually deliver high-quality work. I'll give you an example. The first animator I worked with, I told him, do not use stereotype Japanese in the animation. And he said, OK. And this is what he came back with. Exactly the opposite. But through trial and error, I became good at finding and collaborating with talented freelancers. It really didn't matter where they were, which country they were from or how good their English is. Those who perform well had one thing in common. They communicated in a way that I feel fully understood. For example, Anush, a graphic designer, my graphic designer from Armenia, who helped me design some of the slides you're seeing today, her English skills are not that high. Probably she would score around 600 in a TOEIC, which is an uh, English test. And 600 may translate to something like able to deal with most social situation, but not good enough work. So how does Anush make me feel fully understood? Five specific ways. Number one, signal with facial expression and body languages. Unless she's faces up, looking at me, nodding when she's understanding, stone-faced when she's confused or thinking, tilting your head when she's totally not getting it. She constantly signals through her facial expression and body languages body language, whether she's getting the message or not. Oh, I need to tell you this. I only work with people who, appear, who will appear on video. Because if not, I can't be able to read these messages, right? So that's number one. Number two, she immediately interrupts me when I'm talking too fast. She says, Masa, can you speak more slowly? Not once, not twice, but as many times as necessary until I speak down at the level she's comfortable with. Number three, she constantly stops and clarifies me to make sure that she's understanding me correctly. And the way she clarifies, not only with a hums and okays, but she puts what I'm saying into her own words. I see so many people uttering with ahams and okays, and it's, it's okay to use it once or twice, but, that, but it doesn't really, but it, do, but it isn't really telling you anything, isn't it? Number four, she uses all available tools in Skype, like screen sharing, text box, file transfer, anything to make our communications easier. Number five, she summarizes every so often to avoid even the slightest misunderstanding. She'll say, so you mean, so you're asking for? And, even, and, and when I make even the slightest changes in the order, she'll say, Masa, can I make sure of the changes? And she repeats it in her own words. So those are the five specific ways 
all my favorite freelancers used to communicate. I later learned that this way of communicating has a name, active listening, an act of fully concentrating on what the speaker is saying and letting the speaker know that the messages are, are understood or not. But I see this rarely happening in today's global business. And you know what's interesting? Whenever miscommunication happens, people think it's an English problem, not a communication problem. Let me give you an example. Four years ago, Kenji, who's a Japanese, who, who is a product manager and works for a Japanese printing and imaging manufacturer, was telling me this. Otsuka-san, that's me. Recently, I've been sitting in on more global meetings, and it's a nightmare. And then he was telling me how he gets lost in the first five, 10 minutes, and frustrated, sitting there, what's, sitting there not knowing what's going on. And after the meeting, he blames his English skills and starts, starts learning more vocabulary and phrases. And he polishes his listening skills. He reads more. He increased the time he goes to English language schools. So he sees his next meeting to prove himself that he can contribute. But within the, five, within the next five, 10 minutes, deja vu. He gets lost in the first five, 10 minutes, and he blames his English skills and falls into this negative spiral. So I asked Kenji whether he, I can sit in in one of his meetings, and he agreed. And immediately into the meeting, I knew what was going on. Oops. And, <laughs> and sorry, I forgot this slide. And during this process, so this negative spiral, during this process, Kenji's TOEIC scores keeps rising up, and now he has a 945 TOEIC score, which is nearly perfect, right? Okay. Um, so I asked Kenji whether I can sit in on one of his meetings, and he said, okay. And immediately, sitting into the meeting, I exactly knew what was going on. Kenji was not active listening. His facial expressions were non-existent. He wasn't clarifying. He wasn't stopping and clarifying either. He did not ask his US and European peers to slow down, even though they were speaking way too fast for him. And what about his US and European peers? They were not active listeners either. They just kept talking without, without checking whether Kenji was receiving the messages or not. They never considered their own poor communication skills that were causing part of the problem. So I started to teach active listening to people like Kenji by incorporating the five specific rules, which you can see here. And I tell my students never to blame on your English skills if you have a TOEIC score of over 600. Then it's not an English problem anymore. It's a communication problem. And now, I teach, now I help both native and non-native English speakers to actively listen for more productive meetings. Looking back now, I know exactly why I felt I had a communication disorder. I was afraid of people thinking that I was not smart enough from two distinctive cultural standards. From a Japanese standard, not knowing something and asking that out in public is considered an act of stupidity. In a US standard, 
not asking, uh, not knowing is okay, but you need to say it. Or people will think that you're not smart enough to ask. Global communication falls in between. You need to at least signal with your facial expression whether you're getting your me the messages or not, and those who are explaining need to sense these signals. And the magic ingredients that ties two or more sides together is active listening. And though this may sound easy, it's quite difficult when you start doing this because you feel that you're violating some of your own cultural standards. For a Japanese, interrupting is a challenge because you feel it's rude. For an, for an American, taking the extra time to check whether the other, whether the person is understanding or not, will feel awkward because you're thinking that if they have something to say, they'll say it, right? So it may not be easy for you to do, so at least I'll try to make it easy for you to remember these rules. Here they go again. Facial expressions needs to be shown. Obey speed limits, slow people down. Clarify by paraphrasing. Use all available tools or resources to help you communicate easier. Summarize every so often to avoid even the slightest mistake, misunderstanding. Yes, active listening does require you to focus, doesn't it? And this focus cured my two communication disorders. Because looking back now, I know exactly why my classmates were laughing at me during sixth grade and why I was on my way to failure for my MBA marketing class. It took me around 30 years of struggle, and I do not want that to happen to you. Because global collaboration is only going to increase. And I see so many Kenjis out there suffering, and Kenjis US and European peers are not helping it make Help not, are not helping it make it better. But you can. Because we've been talking about why most global communication fails, and now you know how to do about it, what to do about it, right? It, requ it requires a special type of focus, the five rules. So, for your next global meeting, you know what to do. Give focus a try.